Hi everyone. Welcome to your library at home. My name is Rebecca. I work in the public programs team at the State Library of New South Wales. I'd like to begin this evening by acknowledging that I live and work on Gadigal land, the traditional custodians on this land on which knowledge has been exchanged for millennia. We also celebrate the diverse, the, sorry, we also celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal culture and language across New South Wales. And I take this opportunity to pay my respects to elders past, present and especially emerging and I extend that respect to any Aboriginal Australians who may be joining us online this evening. Welcome to another fantastic instalment of the Be List Book Club. Tonight, we are so very pleased to host Bree Lee in conversation with Chrissy Neen on Chrissy's latest book, The Three Burials of Lottie Neen. The Three Burials of Lottie Neen is available for purchase through the State Library website. The online bookshop can be found on the State Library's website and they offer free delivery. And while we will all prepare for Christmas, an extra incentive for book purchases through our online bookshop is an extra 10% discount on all purchases made for the entire month of October. This discount is in celebration of Love Your Bookshop Day, which was held on October the 9th. To redeem this discount, simply use the promo code OCT2021, OCT2021. The State Library opened its doors on October the 11th and we have been welcoming warmly back our audiences on site. The public programs team are continuing to present events online for the remainder of 2021, sorry, 2021, but we are working towards hosting some upcoming events on site. Um, details of these upcoming events will be online, um, hopefully in the coming week over November and December, we hope to see some of you back on site. The B-List Book Club is a regular series and I will leave the details of the next in the series for Brie to introduce at the conclusion of her talk with Chrissy this evening. I'll now hand over to Brie with a reminder for all of you at home that we will be taking questions at the end of the conversation between Brie and Chrissy. So please send through your questions at any stage using the Q&A feature of the Zoom app. Thank you all for joining us and thanks Brie. Thank you so much, Beck. And thank you to everyone for spending another Thursday evening with us here at the Be List Book Club. I begin as well by acknowledging that where I am live streaming to you from now in my lounge room uh, in Sydney is, of course, Gadigal land in the Eora Nation. And I pay my respects to elders past and present. When I acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land, I recognise also that sovereignty was never ceded. There still is no treaty, and I support the Uluru Statement from the Heart. I am really, really thrilled um, to be in conversation tonight with Chrissy Neen about her latest book, The Three Burials of Lottie Neen. Um, over five years ago now, Chrissy was the first ever writing mentor I ever had. I learned some of the most valuable and fundamental lessons of both the writing craft and the writing life from Chrissy Neen, and they have carried me through till my career today and I truly believe they will carry me through the rest of my career. She is a friend, she is an excellent human and she's an incredibly talented writer. This book is an extraordinary multifaceted journey. The way I understand it is both sort of a part memoir of Chrissy's and also an attempt at a biography of a sort of unwilling subject um, in terms of her grandmother and even her grandmother being an unwilling subject from the grave, essentially. Um, and it is my delight and pleasure and honor to welcome Chrissy Neen to the Be List Book Club tonight. I should read her actual bio, even though you've just heard me <laughs> rave about her. Chrissy Neen is a Brisbane writer. Her novel, An Uncertain Grace, was shortlisted for the 2018 Stella Prize. In 2014, she won the Thomas Shapcott Poetry Prize for Eating My Grandmother. Welcome, Chrissy. Hello, Brie. Um, and Chrissy is in Brisbane, which of course is Yagara and Turrbal land. It is indeed. And I acknowledge um, elders past and present here too. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, I want to start actually well, well before the three burials of Lottie Neen, because I know it's something I've um, been interested to learn since having a memoir out is that people who aren't familiar with the form often get sort of memoir confused with autobiography. Um, and I would love to hear you talk a bit about your first memoir, 
Affection, which came out in twenty in two thousand and nine, and I suppose why there were things in Three Burials that didn't or couldn't go in Affection, and the the difference between the two works. Yeah, when I um, started work on the first memoir, Affection, uh, I really wanted to just detail my relationship to sexuality um, throughout my life. And I wanted to kind of focus very much to only the things that were influencing um, my relationship to sexuality as a bisexual person, um, as someone who... um, you know, struggled to understand other people's relationship to sexuality. I needed to talk a little bit about my family because my family background um, influenced my relationship to sexuality, but I definitely didn't want to talk too much about my family background for a lot of reasons. Um, One of them was that my grandmother was still alive and I was um, terrified (laughs) of her um, and of her wrath, I suppose. So, um, I I wrote that book um, very much just skipping and hinting and giving little glimpses of my grandmother and my um, childhood in that book, but really focusing on sex as being the fundamental thing that I wanted to look at in that book. Um, And this book is kind of entirely different and almost doesn't mention sexuality, I think, um, in the whole book. So, yeah, it's a a very, very different beast from that one. Mm. I would like us to spend a few minutes together for anyone who hasn't yet read the book, painting a portrait of your grandmother, because we're talking about a very complex human being who had a very complex influence and impact on you and your life in a way that I feel comfortable presuming is not like what most people's sort of regular experience of any grandparent um, is. Let's talk about the the sort of positive parts of her first. Tell us a little bit about her strength and the things that you admire about her. Uh, She was an incredibly tough woman, um, uh, incredibly feminist um, for someone of her generation as well. Um, She was absolutely, um, she was strident about art being hugely important like the most important thing in life was art to her. And she kind of almost put that on a pedestal as a religion for us when we were growing up. Art was a practice that we had in our everyday life, but it also was a practice that um, that we had to be reverent of and that had to have its um, rituals um, that surrounded the creation of art as well. Um, so that was absolutely um, fundamental for me being the person that I am today. Uh, she was... She was the matriarch of our family. So she had a husband, my grandfather, who was there, but he was very, very much in the background and very quiet and often in his room. Um, And he was a a pianist and a photographer, Um, but he was often sort of sequestered away in his room. Um, She was the person who set the rules of the house. She was the person who um, my my grandmother had two children, um, my mother and my aunt, and they were um, like older sisters to me and my sister because they didn't set the rules. My mother certainly wasn't the maternal figure that you would expect a mother to be. She was really just the in-between person who was trying to protect us a little bit from my grandmother, but um, also uh, enforce my grandmother's kind of household rules. And those things included not not, um, glimpsing anything to do with sexuality, um, not uh, having anything to do with other kids who might have men in their households. She was very terrified that um, we might somehow be impacted by men somewhere along the way. So um, we were protected, highly protected, um, so that nothing bad would happen to us from these men who were everywhere and could cause us harm. Um, So that was, you know, in a way that's a positive thing because, you know, that is true. You know, uh, people are are often, um, you know, when, when people have, Um, terrible things happening to them it's often from men in their inner circle family circle friendship circle so my grandmother was aware of that and completely protected us from that by not allowing us to have those friendships outside of home Mm -hmm. so um, 
those were really positive things. She also brought us up on a fantastic um, diet of food from her cultural background, uh, which was very different to um, some of the other um, people that I was going to school with. There was a lot of, um, we were vegetarians when we were growing up, but there was a lot of um, beans and pulses and um, beautiful um, oniony flavors as well. Um, so it was really a great um, feast when we were growing up and she made all the meals, made bread every day. Um, she was definitely in charge of the food. Um, and she was also in charge of what we watched on the television. So I watched a lot of, um, a lot of subtitled movies, um, you know, or, or dubbed movies from Italian. Um, and she, you know, she spoke seven languages. And so, um, a, you know, a lot of the things that we were watching, I wasn't really understanding anyway, but a lot of them were dubbed um, and I could kind of hear the English version, but they were very European in their sensibilities. So I grew up with a different sensibility to the other kids too, because I wasn't watching TV like they were watching. I was watching, you know, quite um, archaic movies from another culture. <laughs> The flip side to the strength and the protection is the control. Um, things, so a lot of the specific behaviours that she exhibited reminded me of sort of the framework that we now understand as falling under coercive control in terms of just coercive control and the, the nature of that. Can you talk a bit about the surveillance, the, the opening of your letters, the the feeling that both you and it sounds like your sister and your mother and aunt felt of not having any um, what personal or private space, any yeah. space for yourselves. Yeah, we weren't allowed any any privacy. Privacy was not a thing that was um, given to us as children, I suppose. Um, and that that would have been the same for my mother and my aunt as well, although um, their relationship to that whole thing is very different to my sister and mine. In fact, my sister kind of captures it as abuse now and she's been through a, a period of um, look, looking into it and investigating it and has um, very much framed it as abuse. And a lot of people would frame her behaviour as abuse, um, not letting us have friends, not letting us receive letters that she didn't read, not letting us read books that my mother hadn't vetted for us. So um, if there was a, a sex scene in a book, um, it would be cut out before it was given to us. Uh, if it was from the library, we weren't allowed to read it unless my mother had read it and said, yes, it's okay. I remember having... Um, I think our class was doing Kez, uh, a book that I have never read to this day um, at school, and um, it had a sex scene in it, I think. Um, I don't know because I haven't read it, but it wasn't. I wasn't allowed to partake in that particular class activity. I had to do a whole unit of my own based on a book that I chose um, that was different. So, you know, there were all these kind of... Um, areas that my grandmother was watching everything that I did. We weren't allowed to go anywhere alone. I think that was a massive problem for my sister who um, really wanted her freedom. Um, and, and I remember later on, I'm not sure if it's a story in the book actually, but later on my sister um, told me that when she'd gone, we weren't really allowed on um, school excursions, but when my sister was in grade 11, I think it was, um, she fought to be able to go to just from Blacktown to the city, um, to the museum for an excursion. It was like a half day excursion. So she was allowed to go. And um, she ducked away from the rest of the class and she um, just stayed on the train doing the loop by herself for the whole day and then met them at the place where they were going to meet at the station to come home again because she had never had time not being observed and being away from that kind of adult supervision. And so for her, that idea of sitting on a train for an entire day and going round and round by yourself um, was some kind of luxury um, and, you know, I didn't have that same need for absolute aloneness. I actually had a, um, a very um, active um, fantasy life with characters that spent their whole days with me. Invisible friends that lasted way longer than I should have <laughs> invisible friends for, but they were my friends and I loved them and eventually they became characters and stories that I was writing down. So, um, you know, I used those invisible friends um, and pretended they were just characters, but they were my friends. Um, and so, you know, we I found ways of dealing with that, but certainly, um, you know, we weren't allowed to eat food that wasn't that she hadn't made. 
um, the, the flip side of the wonderful food that she made was that we weren't allowed to eat food from outside, outside food, which was somehow poison. Um, and we had to, you know, we just had to obey her rules. There was no kind of private life for us. So um, that was, you know, it was stressful because as kids, we weren't like the other kids and we knew it. But um, we also knew that we were migrant kids. We were in Blacktown in a whole kind of city full of migrants. Um, and our school was full of migrant kids and we knew that we were migrants too. But we didn't really know, um, like all the other kids had, you know, they had Greek school that they went to on the weekends or they had my one of my best friends had Ukrainian dancing that she went to. But um, I didn't have any connection to my cultural heritage and my grandmother didn't um, let me find out about it either. So I got glimpses of where I was from and I knew that I was from Slovenia, although she wouldn't, for ages, she wouldn't name it. Um, and then, you know, when I did find out where it was, I thought, big deal, there's no secret in being from Slovenia. But, um, you know, it seemed to be a massive secret that she didn't want me to tell people. Mm. Okay, I want to come to that in a bit, but just before we do, can you please explain the winning the lotto story <laughs> it, it seems there's a whole bunch of things that happened in my life that were very strange and this was the first of them I think um so my my family weren't um didn't have a lot of money uh they my, my grandfather worked and for a while my aunt worked um but um the rest of them they did these paper mache creatures that they made the um, big ones big ones giant yeah. ones so my grandmother would made this display. Um, my clearest memories are of making the dinosaur display for the Sydney Museum. So they were life-size dinosaurs for the Sydney Museum that were displayed at the Sydney Museum. Um, they were, you know, they spent months and months and months making these dinosaurs out of paper that were very accurate to the books on dinosaurs. Um, you know, they were just amazing things. And um, they spent months making them. But, you know, they just got like a fee for having them and the museum didn't have much money. They had a fee for putting them in the museum and that was, you know, the income for that project. So very much like being a writer where you get like this tiny little bit of money and then that's it, see ya. <laughs> um, so, yeah, set me up well for that. But um, <laughs> but it's so... And good it, expectations. <laughs> yeah, that's like low expectations for what I'm going to earn out of my art, my artwork. Um, so these, these, and they also did stuff for the libraries. So they'd make um, Easter displays for the libraries and get a little fee for that and stuff. So, you know, pocket money really, or money that went back into buying the materials to make the paper mache models. Um, but this is what they did and this is how they subsisted. Um, and it was a, it's a frugal life. Um, but every week my grandmother would play the lotto and she was obsessed by counting the numbers and had this little system, she had a little kind of mini lotto machine that she would do and she'd do something with a calculator. I have no idea what she was doing. But then one, um, one week she won the lotto and, you know, it was a big deal. She was in a syndicate with people in her street, so it wasn't the only person in that kind of win. So it was um, some of the people in the street had got together and put a, a lotto ticket in and it won. So she got to take her amount and it was enough for her to decide, that's it, we're done with Blacktown. We're going to move the whole family to Queensland where we're going to start this big um, like Disneyland-like thing where we're going to put the paper mache models and people will pay and come and look at them and she'll tell stories about the fairy tales and um, that would be our life from then on. Why, when, okay, no, I'm going to reframe that. What were some of your earliest memories of trying to ask your grandma like where your family came from and and what, were the kinds of responses you got? Well, I, I, one of the things that I've actually written in the book was um, when at school we were asked to do a family tree and I was a, you know, girly SWAT student, as I'm sure you were, Brie. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to do the best work. Um, and so I wanted this assignment to be really good, even though I was in primary school. Um, and so, you know, drew the tree and everything. And then I had to fill it with people and I could fill it with my grandmother and my grandfather and my mother and my aunt and my sister and even my father who um, didn't live with us, but I knew his name. So I put him on the family tree. But um, I didn't have any idea 
of any other people in our family. I didn't know, you know, there were questions about where we come from that we needed to put in there. And um, I just asked and I knew it wasn't right to ask because that was one of the things that I wasn't supposed to know. Um, but I asked and she basically said it's none of their business. They're being nosy. You know, it's the Spanish Inquisition. Um, you, you, they're, they're just trying to get information out of you. Um, and so she said, you know, for, for her job, she said put playing with paper was supposed to be her job. And where she came from, she said, no man's land, that's where I came from, is no man's land, which actually is quite accurate. Um, in the long term, I kind of discovered that it was really a bit of a no man's land at the time that she had been there, the place that um, she was from. So she wasn't lying exactly, but she was certainly obscuring the truth. Mm. So that was, um, you know, that was one of the earliest attempts to kind of get to the bottom of where I was from. And then, of course, because she was so unwilling to share any information, it became a bit of a lifetime obsession for me to discover where we were from and why it was such a secret that I wasn't allowed to know um, her background. Um, and, and I knew that my mother and my aunt were born in Egypt. I knew they weren't born in Slovenia. And I knew my grandfather was born in Egypt and that his family had been there for generations. But I just couldn't get to the bottom of why any of this had happened or what had brought her to Egypt and, you know, yeah, why she'd left Slovenia. None of that was clear at all. I just want to remind everyone who's um, watching at home that at any point in time you can type questions into the Q&A function um, and I will be asking them of Chrissy at the end of our chat. Um, what happened later in life when you tried to make a documentary about your family? And why would you use the word combative to describe that experience? Yes, it was very difficult. Um, so I'd already made a couple of documentaries um, and I thought, I found my feet now. I'd, I'd like to tell the story that I really care about, my grandmother's story. So um, I got a little film crew together and um, got some funding from um, the ABC and a producer and set off uh, to film Dragon Hall, which was the place in central Queensland that she'd moved us to. And um, they were keen for me to do the documentary because they thought it might publicise Dragon Hall and more people might come and start, um, you know, paying the money to go through Dragon Hall because it had been less than successful, their Disneyland um, you know, their Disneyland kind of thing wasn't really successful. And so um, they thought that it would be like an ad for Dragon Hall that I would be making. But of course, I was more interested in the personal story and the story of my grandmother and thought that if I was there with a camera asking questions that she would have to just, you know, I'm her, I'm her flesh and blood, she'd have to come clean with something. Um, and so, you know, I spent three months um, sort of filming them and, you um, filming scenes that were great, like they're making their paper mache models. Um, I got her to tell a story based on one of the fairy tales that she had. Um, my aunt got out her reel-to-reel -reel, um, tape recorder and um, showed us how she used to make music concrete before there was any sampling. She was like sampling basically and making music out of samples. It was a, a French thing that she was very interested in. So I had all these fantastic scenes, but when it came to sitting around the table, asking my grandmother about how she got to Australia, um, where she was from, you know, she just shut it all down. It was like I was asking her to appear naked in front of the camera. She just refused. And in fact, um, there was a wonderful little scene um, that I caught on film where um, I was saying to her, look, mum, you can't. You, you can't just shut this down. I'm your flesh and blood. I'm not going to make you look bad. If you think I'm going to make you look bad, it's going to be, you know, a fond representation. I'm not going to make you look bad because it'll make me look bad. And she just sort of leaned in and went, ah, but I know you deep, deep inside. I know you. I'm not going to tell you anything. And it was just like this moment when I watched it back, <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> you're like you really are the witch you everyone called her a witch and she kind of really was and she said she didn't trust you she said I know you like and I don't trust you yeah she didn't trust me and it's you know I I mean I suppose granted she didn't trust me because she knew that I would probably use it in a book 
which is true. <laughs> because she knew about artists and she, she knew, knew about the primacy of art. Yes, exactly. But, you know, I was never going to say anything. And I, the, the thing that I do with any of my writing or any of my documentary making is I never, ever go in to make the subject look bad. So even in every book that I've written that have been about real people, I've always tried really hard to be kind to those people. Um, try and find them, even if someone's an asshole try and find the nice thing about them to put in the book so you can empathize because everybody has their you know there's no bad people there's no good people it's just people who are bad and good you know who do bad and good things so um, I was really really trying to be nice to her and everything that I wrote about her but um, she didn't care she just did not want anything out in the world um could you do your reading now, please? Yeah. Um, so, um, and maybe just explain, I suppose, about when your grandmother did pass away that you felt that that was the time that you could finally go hunting, I suppose, for the for the story. Yeah, I had, um, you know, I'd been, been wanting to go to Slovenia. I felt like the only way to find out anything about my history was to go. And um, this is a chapter about a conversation about that while my grandmother was still alive. So um, at this point, she's still alive, but, you know, this particular conversation continued after her death as well. I've been saving up for a holiday. My grandmother is shuffling the 500 pack, her hands quick, her fingers strong. I have waited till we finished eating, the dishes stacked, the miniature horses and alpacas and peacocks safely tucked up in their pens. My grandmother makes a sound, an explosion of derision forged between tight lips. <sighs> nice for some. I know it is shameful to have enough money for a holiday when they can't ever even buy new clothes. My mother jumps to my rescue. Chrissy and Anthony work hard, Mum. They need to take a break sometime. I never stop with work, she says, which is true, but also untrue. She is forever making one model or another, studying the physiology of kangaroos or basilisks or gnomes, but it is a pointless effort since they stopped opening the doors of Dragon Hall on weekends. They used to spend every Saturday and Sunday just waiting, forever waiting for the public to arrive. In theory, Dragon Hall is still open by appointment, but in reality, they don't even change into their uniform on weekends now. They have let the ice blocks in the freezer, the ones that are reserved for the public, creep past their use-by dates. My grandmother still works because what else would she do? But there's nothing to work towards anymore. Well, I want you to have a holiday too, Mum. Holiday? Where? To Slovenia. I want you to go with me. Her face darkens in the silence. There was never any real chance that she would jump at the offer. Go then. And the way she says it is a reprimand. It is a horrible place. There's no war there anymore. She makes a sound like she has sucked in a whole lemon in one breath. When she speaks, I can hear the acid working its way out through her voice. There is nothing there, all destroyed. My village is gone, no family there. It's a military place. Military zone, my aunt corrects, always adding to what my grandmother says, always a half of her voice. Sometimes I'm not sure if an idea has come from my grandmother's mouth or my aunt's. Their voices are so completely in harmony. No, it isn't. People say it's one of the most peaceful countries in Europe. People. All right, people. You take these people with you. You disrespect me? Go then. Go to Slovenia. See if I care less. Disrespect. Care less. She shuffles the cards with venomous intent. You want to play 500 now? I was offering to pay your ticket, all expenses. It wouldn't cost you anything. You try to buy my love? You don't measure cost in dollars, this cost. You measure what it will cost you without the dollars. She deals the cards. She always wins these games. There is no point playing against her. The only one of us who could ever beat her was my grandfather and he is long dead. I take my cards, preemptively tasting defeat. Open Mazaire, my grandmother says, and my mother groans. We have a policy of not playing Open Mazaire because it is my grandmother's favourite hand to play and it is rarely any fun for anyone to play but her. 
Her partner, which is always my aunt, just has to fold her cards and watch as she wipes the floor with the other players. No secrets, no bluffs, just a steady run of my grandmother winning every hand that is played. My grandmother is angry. I have angered her, and so we play open misere. She wins. We deal again. Open misere, she says. An hour of watching my grandmother steadily beat us all. Later in the kitchen, washing the dinner plates, I put the question to my mother. If mum won't come, we can take you to Slovenia instead. To Slovenia? We'll pay for everything. I can't. Come on, mum, it'll be fun. Mother-daughter adventure. Chrissy, please, I can't, she says. Then don't, as if I'm hurting her. In a way, I am. Her one word, don't, warning me not to push her harder, warning me not to go. Of course, I won't go. I can't go, because if I do, that would be disobeying my grandmother, throwing down the gauntlet of my disrespect. My grandmother's mother, my grandmother's mother died, and the two of them had not spoken for the entire length of my life. My great aunt died, and the silence stretched sticky between them. My great uncle died, and at least he had made an effort to visit us, driving all the way to Broran in his sporty red car. But we didn't go to his funeral. In our family, small and unintended slights fell like iron spikes between my grandmother and those she loved. I'd never go to Slovenia, at least not while my grandmother was still alive. Thank you. When you found out your grandmother had passed away, was it almost an immediate follow-on thought that you could finally go to Slovenia? That was certainly there. I'd, I'd certainly been hovering around the idea that if my, if I said, if my grandmother dies, <laughs> because she's I, a witch, <laughs> she would ever die. Um, but when she was 98, she did die. And um, I had in the back of my head, I had thought I will be able to follow this story. I'll be able to find out more when she dies. Um, so it wasn't like I immediately booked a flight. In fact, I dragged my feet for years because um I felt that she was still watching me and I felt that she would know and she'd smite me. I felt that if I did go to Slovenia and wrote a book about it, she'd do something, you know, disastrous, climate change. I want to stay with this for a moment because I felt a tension throughout this book that you have a love and a great respect for science, both for science methodology and for scientific information and results, but that and, and, you know, that you are willing to sort of poop our friends who believe in, um, you know, yep. other types of, you know, like alternative medicine or, or things like that. But then yep. there's also all of these sections where you express real, um, like either fear or um, uh, lack of what, surety in your beliefs about like her or about after her passing can you talk a, a bit about that contradiction I suppose well she she believed in magic she believed she was magic she believed that she had powers um and she told us that all through her life and so I didn't like on one hand I didn't believe it because I you know like to read about things and you know I like to think that the world was the way science explains it but I from a very early age my grandmother had you know been healing our sickness with her hands um she would um you know say something would happen and it would magically happen so she'd been kind of proving to us that she did have powers since we were very young and so i i still to this day have this feeling that even though i do believe that you know science is real and magic is not that magic is also real as well <laughs> so weird that I can have these two parallel beliefs at the same time but you know there are there are things that I, I don't know there are things that she did that I can't explain and you know when she died we went to pick up her ashes and um, we picked them up and then on the way back from the funeral home uh, we were chased by a massive storm cloud that was like you know warnings and like I was watching the the bomb website in the car and we were basically like 
just a minute away from this giant hailstorm that followed us all the way back to my grandmother's place with her ashes. It was just like, you know, that made sense to me that she was there chasing me. And even when, you know, when I'd finished writing the book, I still had this sense that, that she would do something to stop me from writing it. And they'd, um, you know, publication date was set for um, September in um 2020 September 2020 and then you know I was about to go into my edit at the beginning of 2020 and the pandemic happened and I was like yeah, she's just gonna kill everybody rather than like like kill me she's just gonna kill everybody um, and of course it didn't turn out to be quite like that the pandemic but all the way through the pandemic I kept feeling like it was her and then of course my book got bumped back to um, publication and I just thought yeah she's bumping it back because we're not it's never going to come out it's you know the whole publishing industry is going to collapse before this book comes out and I won't be able to publish it because she stopped it so I, I have these two conflicting ideas and it really is because from a very early age um, she told me that she was magic. She told me her grandmother was magic and she told me she'd pass the magic down to me. Mm -hmm. So I had this kind of clear sense that I had these powers um, that were given to me by, by my grandmother and by her grandmother before her. Mm. Talk to me about landing in Slovenia. It was, it was really strange because um, I felt like... I would get off the plane and everything would be clear. I would look around and there'd be people just like me um, and this would be a sense of homecoming um, and I would see people like me for once and I would go, ah, I can see where I came from. But Slovenians are not um, like me. They are, they're mountain going creatures. They love walking up and down mountains um, and they're very fit. They're very thin. They're quite blonde often. <laughs> so uh, there's a whole different kind of cultural mix of people that were there in the capital when I got there that didn't remind me of me at all. So I felt like there were some things that I felt were really familiar. There was a big dragon on um, the bridge, like a giant, two giant dragons um, on the bridge and dragons on everything, the castle, walls. Um, and my grandmother was obsessed by dragons. So that was very familiar. Um, but in terms of the people, I felt like they were a different race of people and they weren't anything like me at all. So it was strange. And yet as I settled in and got to talk to more people, I found that they had a similar abruptness and directness. They didn't, um, they didn't mince words. They didn't tell you, you look great today if they think you look like crap. You know, they're not those sort of people. They're people who just say what they think outright. And I've, that's what my family is like as well. So I fe felt that that was something that was very familiar. And they also talk about art and ideas and philosophy all the time. And um, that's what my family did as well. They didn't have small talk. They just, well, my grandmother was alive. We just talked about ideas, you know, something that we'd read in the National Geographic or, you know, we really didn't, art, we talked about art movements. Yeah, there wasn't any kind of chat about small talk at all. Mm -hmm. So that was something that I felt um, very familiar with too. Mm -hmm. There are a few parts in the book, particularly when you're traveling, where you talk about why your body is specifically the thing that makes you feel distant from, you know, otherwise perhaps having a stronger sense of like recognition, for example, when you land in Slovenia. Can you talk a bit about um, all that stuff that I know you researched, which then started coming through about, um, I don't even, like you're the, you're the expert, I don't even know how to... Uh, it's, summarize it like the the gut stuff and the the genetic biology stuff and how that you feel that you carry that through the genetic stuff and how that translates to your corporeal form I did feel like when I started researching this book I thought one of the things that I would be able to find out would be um what I'd inherited physically in my body um and I think that that um became a bit of a, a side research project for me where I started to look at, uh, I started to think about food culture and how the food that we were served was very different from other kids. And I started to think about how migrants, 
you know, you grow up and, um, and as I researched what your gut does, it has, you know, your, your gut bacteria is uniquely your own and it's culturally specific as well. So you get your bacteria that's in your gut and on your skin from the people around you, from your, um, your mother and your mother's mother, that kind of first gulp is actually viscera from your parent, your mother. So um, that becomes a population that lasts in your gut for your life, unless something drastic kills everything. Um, but that, and so that is the way you digest food. And of course your gut we know is your second brain and it's where it affects your emotions. It, it affects what you hunger for. It affects um, your mental health. Um, and so I felt like some of um, my mental health issues would be kind of um, distinguished by, you know, it would be led by that gut bacteria and that I could like track that back through generations as well, because that is passed down through the maternal line. Um, it was something that's fascinating. And I still think that um, someone, some scientist needs to do a project on um, cultural displacement and gut bacteria and how eating foods that are unfamiliar uh, actually affect that gut bacteria and affect your health, both mentally and physically. Uh, I'm sure someone's beginning to do that project now, but it's such new science that um, that project hadn't been done when I was researching the book and I was desperate for someone to do it. Um, but I, I also learned about how people who'd been through starvation events, um, they actually, um, that changes their whole um, metabolism. There's epigenetic changes that happen where someone goes through a famine um, and then your body just shifts and changes and starts to store when you might've been a thin person, you start to store food um, because it thinks, you know, well, we've been through a famine and so your body thinks we're gonna go through another one. And so it holds on to the fat that you eat as well. And I know that um, I knew that my fatness wasn't to do with um, eating junk food or like I know other people have problems with, you know, with disordered eating and that sort of stuff. But I knew that my fatness wasn't to do with that because I've got a similar obsession with eating really great food that my grandmother did. You know, like I eat a lot of whole foods and I eat um, really, really good examples, um, you know, of food. Like I love food, but I love um, good food. I don't like junk food. So I knew that that wasn't my issue. And I, I somehow thought that that could somehow something that happened to my grandmother or her mother would explain why my body continues to store um, fat. As I get older and older, I get fatter and fatter. And I thought that that might be a part of that story. Um, and I kind of feel like there were connections and things that I learned that were about the body. Um, but I think that I hadn't quite got to the end of that discovery by the end of writing this book. So the next book has kind of gone into the realms of the body and into fatness and into um, my relationship to my body and mental health. But there are little glimpses of that stuff in this book because it was certainly manifesting in Slovenia, which is made for people much thinner than I am. Yeah. What is an, and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of this, Alexandrinka? I think it's Alexandrinka. I think that's how you say it. Um, so I didn't know about this until after being in Slovenia for a couple of months and doing research and coming to nothing, um, kind of not nothing, but realising that there weren't the clear answers. I thought that this was going to be a book with no clear answer and I'd have to kind of cobble it together from all these kind of questions. Um, and then I decided I would start to research why my mother was born in Egypt and my aunt and my grandfather and what that story was. So I was sitting in a little... Um, sitting in a little cafe to where I worked. It's a beautiful little cafe um, above a bookshop. And I went down to the bookshop and I kind of asked the lady there if she had any books about Egypt. Um, and she sort of said, oh, pharaohs or, you know, what do you want? And I was like, no, no, my grandmother went to Egypt from Slovenia and I don't know why. So any kind of cultural stuff. And she sort of went, oh, your grandmother was Alexandrinka. And this is the first time I'd heard this word and I never, I didn't know what it meant. And she explained to me that um, this, that the women, like 40% of the women from this very specific area in Slovenia, which included my grandmother's village, 40% of them went to Egypt to work, um, sort of like 
economic migrants. There were um, economic problems at home, which were caused by um, a, a push from um, the um, Italian border, which was constantly being pushed back and forth along that area of Slovenia, um, when the Italians were in charge of that particular area, when the border was you know, over my grandmother's village, um, it meant that the people weren't allowed to speak their own language um, and that kids weren't allowed to speak it in school or they'd get punished um, and that men, the men weren't allowed to work. Um, and so there was, people were starving. That whole kind of region of Slovenia was um, starving for you know, years. And so um, it became known that Slovenian women were really, really good nannies um, to Italian, to rich Italian women's children because they spoke Italian. One of the languages that they had was Italian. They spoke Italian. Um, they were Catholic, which the Italians liked, um, and that they were um, kind, apparently, to the children unlike my grandmother, apparently the, Slo the rest of the Slovenian women were really kind to children. Um, and so they got this name as being really, really good nannies. And the Italian women started to move to Egypt because the cotton boom was on and Egypt became the cultural capital of the world at that point. And it became this melting pot of cultures as well. And so a lot of the rich Italians moved and a lot of them um, took the Slovenian nannies with them and the other cultural groups became jealous of these great nannies um, that were Slovenian. And so it became this status symbol to own a Slovenian nanny, you know, that would um, bring up your kid and teach them. And, um, and also well, wet nurse, a lot of the Slovenian women went over as wet nurses, which was quite sad because they would um, have a baby back in Slovenia, leave the baby with a neighbor, the church, a cousin, and then they'd go to um, Egypt to send to earn money, um, nursing someone else's children, and then being the nanny for them and sending that money home. And some of these women didn't get home for you know 30, 40, 50 years and didn't see these children that they'd um, given birth to or their families back home. So it was it became quite a, a shameful period um, in Slovenian history, which got forgotten for a generation because these women had basically secured that their families could actually eat. They, they'd, they had sent money home. Um, they had been working really hard. They had sent money home. But there were a number of reasons why the Slovenians who were left behind, often the men, um, distrusted this whole experience because they were disempowered. Uh, they were no longer the breadwinner. Um, they also, the, the Catholic Church, even though they helped the women get placements and earned money off that, they started putting around pamphlets to say that these women were um, of low morals because they were in Egypt and they were being exposed to, um, you know, terrible um, Egyptian ways and, um, and that they were, some of them were working as prostitutes, which they might have been, but they didn't need to because um, they were earning a really good wage as these nannies from these rich people. So, you know, it became this kind of forgotten period of history where these women went, did all this hard work, left their families and didn't see them for, you know, decades. Um, and then when it was all over, they um, kind of lost status. They went home again after all this time to people that they were estranged from. Um, and they'd in Egypt, they had learnt how to, they had silk dresses instead of the homespun dresses from home. They learnt um, about different sexualities, different genders, because it was quite a, um, it was quite a cultural, um, you know, a, a cultural hub. And so there were, you know, there was lots of, there was queer culture over in Egypt. There was a permissiveness that wasn't allowed at home. And so they'd read all this stuff and they'd met all these people from all over the world. Some of them had travelled with um, the families to different countries all over the world. And then they went home and they had to hide all of this. This was something that was shameful and had to be hidden. So um, it was like it really cracked open this whole story because my my grandmother's mother was one of these Alexandrinka and um, finding out that that was her story, that, that my grandmother had been left behind in Slovenia as a small child, as her mother went to try and earn money, and then that she'd been called for later 
um, and all of the children one by one were called for and, and went to Egypt and that she had left Slovenia then and gone to Egypt and then lived there and then started work there as, I suppose, a second generation Alexandrinka. It was, you know, it really cracked my whole story open. I suddenly realised what my grandmother had been through, why she was so terrified of things that she was terrified of. And um, the strength that she needed to do that, the strength of will that kept her alive during that whole time was amazing. Mm. Um, I want to leave the conversation in terms of what you found out about your grandmother, sorry, there, um, so that we don't spoil it for people who haven't read it yet. Um, and the final question I have for you before we go to a couple of audience questions is, the book sort of finishes with just this, like I had a sort of stomach in mouth feeling of, of, and I hope that you can share a bit about what it felt like to call your mum and tell her about what you'd found. What was that like being it? Because the, the pr pretty clear presumption is that your grandmother also sort of, yeah, hid certain things from your, your mum. What was it like to be able to share that with her? It was amazing to be able to do that with my mother. Um, so to actually be able to kind of come back and to say to mum, this is what I found out and just really honestly and openly talk to her about that trip and about what I discovered and about um, things that had made sense for me. There was a moment of feeling like I could finally give back, um, you know, I could finally enlighten her uh, and, you know, it, it didn't, last forever because my aunt is my aunt was you know they're still they're still children of my grandmother and my aunt was towing the family line and not wanting this story to be the way I explained it because my aunt was the secret keeper and she'd been told by her mother what the story was and it didn't match my story because of course the secrets were being kept and so um, there was this kind of disconnect unfortunately so after this really beautiful conversation that I had. I was making food that I remember from my childhood. I'd set that up. The whole house was filled with these smells. I felt like I'd come to this final realisation of who I was, called my mother, told her the story. She said, I've never heard this. This is something I've never heard. It sounded like she was on board with everything. And then, um, you know, my aunt's version of it interfered with um, the whole telling of the story, unfortunately. So nothing has been healed or fixed from that side. You know, I don't think there is a way I can heal my family from what they have been raised in. I don't feel like I can change their minds about things now. I feel like it's too late to fix. But I feel like for me, I have learnt a lot of things and I feel like I've changed as a person as a result of this journey and finding out who she was and there's a lot of forgiveness too that I've been able to kind of do a lot of forgiving um, because I, I know how awful and hard it was for her as a child and throughout her whole life of struggle too. Mm, thank you. Um, we have two questions from the audience so far. Just a reminder for everyone, this is your last chance if you have any others. A question from Brody: Has the book's publication led to more answers to the questions of your family history? It has, actually. It has. Um, there's uh, been some interesting connections that I've made with some people. Um, some of them are outlined in the book, so I won't sort of spoil those, but those have been deepened by, um, you know, I did those um, genetic kits and suddenly the things that I had discovered personally being over in Egypt and in Slovenia have been kind of, um, have been cemented with, um, you know, we have found your third cousin. <laughs> and, yeah. and these things have been cemented through um, those kind of notifications and, and contacting those people. So there've been more, there's been more of that happening. But also um, I was doing a talk in Sydney at the Sydney Writers Festival. Um, and afterwards at the signing table, uh, a bookseller came up to me, actually, a man who's a bookseller, and he came up to me and said, I, my grandmother is from Slovenia and my grandfather is from Egypt. And um, I didn't know why. <laughs> and, 
listening to you, I realized she was an Alexandrinka and that she met my grandfather and he was, you know, an Egyptian. And that's how that happened. So that's been really interesting to kind of have that stone drop for other people who didn't know that story because it's been kept such a secret. Um, there's also been, um, there's been stuff on my grandfather's side that's come up since. So there's somebody, um, a Neen actually, who was researching the Neen, the Comerford Neen line, and who discovered that um, my grandfather had been in Egypt for five generations and that his um, wife was a Cypriot uh, and um, at that time. So probably kind of with a Turkish influence, cultural influence as well. And also discovering that my um, great grandmother, my, my grandfather's mother, um, you know, was also, um, you know, had um, Syrian background. So there's those kind of connections have just deepened now that the book is out. And I've been able to talk to people about the Syrian side and about those five generations of people on that side. So that's been, you know, absolutely fantastic. But, you know, this, it's amazing how the things you don't know about your family history, you know, I've only recently, uh, my father doesn't really feature much in the book because he left when I was young and um, didn't really play a part in the story. But, you know, recently one of his relatives had said, I've just discovered that your great grandmother was um, a Radri woman. So, you know, now I suddenly kind of go, oh, I've got an ancestor who was a Radri person as well. So there's a whole side of my life that I haven't explored, which, um, I'd love to kind of look at and see where that story goes as well. So your stories just keep fanning out, I suppose, mm. as you go on. Um, the last question from Jacqueline is, had you started writing this during your grandmother's lifetime? I hadn't started writing this book specifically, but I had started writing about her. So mm. I'd have a little file in my computer, which was called The Bitter Book of Memories. Um, because she once said that um, if she were to write a book about her life, she would call it the bitter book of memories. Uh, I thought that was a beautiful title. So I started a file in my computer about that. And I started to write down things I remembered about conversations from my childhood in that. So in a way, I'd started to do that research, but none of that eventually became a part of this book. So it, it really felt like this book needed to be the journey I was on needed to be what sparked the memories. And I didn't even open the bitter book of memories while I was writing the book. I just kind of, that had been there ticking away and I had some, you know, small stories in there, um, but I didn't even open it because I wanted to really start on this and, and see what memories were jogged by my current research. Mm, wonderful, thank you. Um, that's the end of our conversation. Do you, uh, are you happy to mention um, what you've been working on and when we can see when we can expect to see that next? Yes, I have been um, taking those threads of body research that I've been doing in um, three burials uh, and my relationship to my body and to fatness um, and doing a lot of research. Um, in fact, the um, copyright agency um, gave me a fellowship to do that research, which was fantastic. Um, and so I spent a year really deep diving into the body, into fatness, into it turns out into gender, into um, sexuality uh, and menopause. And um, I've come up with a book that's at the moment called Fat Girl Dancing. Uh, and I have submitted that in the last couple of weeks um, to text. So no conversations yet about when it's going to come out or if it's going to come out, I'm sure it will. But I imagine that it will be 2022 or 2023 that that book comes out. Well, your grandmother presumably has less of an issue with that book, so it should be fine to come out on schedule. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, for everyone watching, thank you for joining us again. The next B-List Book Club is on Thursday, the 25th of November. Yes, that's right. November is the next month. Oh, my gosh. Where did the year go? Uh, the event listing will be online next week. Uh, and my guest on Thursday, the 25th of November will be Helen Garner talking about her third volume of Diaries. Um, and I think that will be quite a popular event. Um, and thank you again hugely to um, my friend, the fantastic author, Chrissy Nee. Hope you have a lovely night. Thanks, Bree. Thanks. It's been wonderful. <laughs>